Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today for a wonderful discussion, or long, day-long discussion on the Horn of Africa and Gulf relations with the Horn of Africa. My name is Raymond Karam. I'm the uh, Senior Director for Programs and Outreach at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. And we are delighted to be here for the fourth year of the UAE Security Forum, second year on the campus of NYU Abu Dhabi. With that, I'll just introduce our uh, new president who took over in May of this year, Ambassador Doug Silliman, who served uh, previously as uh, US ambassador to Iraq and also US ambassador to Kuwait. Uh, his bio is in uh, the agenda that you have with you. Uh, and he'll be here throughout the day. So please free, feel free to introduce yourself to him if you have not met him yet. With that, Ambassador Silliman. Good morning, everyone. As uh, Raymond said, thank you, Raymond, for the kind introduction. I'm Doug Silliman, the new president of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today to the fourth UAE Security Forum in Abu Dhabi, um, held annually by the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Um, especially since this is my first UAE Security Forum, I'm particularly interested in what is going to be said today. The topic matter is always interested, interesting when we uh, coordinate and collaborate with our Emirati friends. But today we have a new set of topics uh, that is particularly important in the current world and I think that you'll be very interested in uh, what people have to say today. But before I uh, start the program, I want to thank our partners and sponsors in this year's event, particularly Lockheed Martin International, the US UAE Business Council, the AmCham Abu Dhabi, and the AmCham Dubai, and our media partner, The National. Uh, the focus of our discussions today will be the Horn of Africa and the growing influence that Gulf Arab states are exercising in this very important strategic area of the world. Now, East Africa has long attracted the attention of its Arabian neighbors across the Red Sea, and at only 355 kilometers at its widest point, that's 220 miles for you Americans in the crowd, and only 28 kilometers or 17 miles at the Bab el-Mendeb, the Red Sea has acted more as a bridge than a barrier to commerce and connections between Arabia and Africa for millennia. And with so little difference separating these two regions, Trade has flourished for thousands of years in grain and livestock, lumber, salt, coffee, spices, and frankincense. But commerce is not the only thing that has brought these two regions together. There are, over the millennia, ties of culture, of religion, and of traditions that have knit the fabrics of both sides of the Red Sea together. For example, on the instructions of the Prophet Muhammad, the Muslims of the first Hijra fleeing persecution in Mecca crossed the Red Sea to the Christian king kingdom of Aksum in Abyssinia in what is modern day Ethiopia and Eritrea. Arabic is the official language and official language or widely spoken in Djibouti, Eritrea, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, and of course in Egypt. Oman gained control of Zanzibar in the 1600s and even moved its capital to the island for a time in the middle of the 19th century. But over the millennia, the ties between Arabia and Africa have ebbed and flowed with interest in the economy. But in recent years, as the Arab Gulf states have expanded their international outreach, they have also extended and exerted greater influence and strengthen their ties to Africa. For example, in the 1990s, DP World began investing in the port of Durale in Djibouti. In 2015, the UAE started work on a military outpost in Asab, just inside the Bab el-Mendeb in Eritrea. And in 2016, DP World started developing a larger port project in Somaliland, in northern Somalia. At the same time, Qatar and Turkey have been pursuing port projects and naval outposts in Sudan and Somalia, and other Gulf-based companies have created extensive logistics networks from Kenya into Uganda, but also throughout Southern Africa and even Western Africa. Why all of this economic interest now? 
That is because the needs of the Gulf can be served by many of the commodities and the things that African countries are able to do, and particularly in the Horn of Africa. African farms can be a good, reliable source of food for the future. Ports and logistics operations established by Gulf entities in the Horn of Africa and elsewhere in the east coast of Africa provide access to African products and access to African markets. They also serve as hubs to project economic and naval power to the rest of Africa and to the greater Indian Ocean Basin. The Red Sea and the Bab el-Mendeb are principal choke points for global trade transiting the Suez Canal. And stability on both sides of the Red Sea is needed to prevent terrorist attacks and disruptions of regional or global trade. So for these reasons, the Gulf Arab states have placed a premium on stability in the Horn of Africa. The UAE and Saudi Arabia worked closely with the United States and the African Union in 2018 to end the 20-year war between Ethiopia and Eritrea with the deal consummated by a high-profile signing ceremony in Jeddah. More recently, working in concert with the African Union, the UAE and Saudi Arabia supported the government transition in Sudan with an eye to preventing the establishment of a fragile or destabilizing state there. And as we will hear more today, linkages between the Horn of Africa and the Gulf states are being forged in many other sectors at many levels of government, society, and the economies. So our goal in this conference today is to shine a light on the breadth and the depth of these important relationships. And to do so, we have assembled a very impressive roster of regional experts, uh, and I know that you, like I am, are very much looking forward to hearing from them. So with that in mind, it is my great pleasure to launch our discussions this morning by introducing our first speaker, the U.S. Ambassador to the UAE, Ambassador John Ricolta. Ambassador Ricolta was confirmed by the U.S. Senate in September and arrived in UAE shortly thereafter to take up his duties here in Abu Dhabi. He is a civil engineer, a business executive, and a civic leader from Detroit, Michigan, and uh, the Detroit News last year named him as Michiganian of the Year for his work to improve public schools in Michigan. He brings with him a wealth of experience to his new position representing the United States here in the UAE. So I would like to introduce to all of you Ambassador John Ricolta. Mr. Ambassador. Well, thank you, Ambassador Silman, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, those uh, facts that you have just given concerning um, uh, the closeness of the Horn of Africa to, uh, to the Arabian Peninsula was underscored just recently in a TV series that has been produced about the origins of the UAE. And uh, it was really quite fascinating. And it's going to start playing in the United States uh, at the end of, of December, a four-part series done by uh, National Geo, and, and I can't remember who the production company was, but here's the important fact, that there at one point in time was no, uh, the, that 28-mile separation was zero, and it is now believed that 125,000 years ago, due to a ice age, and the seas were lowered quite substantially, they say by 80 feet, there was actually an ability of man to walk across from the Horn of Africa to the Arabian Peninsula, and they have proven this by some archaeological finds from 125,000 years ago that basically say that this uh, settlement somewhere here in the UAE, I can't remember the name, was basically the second cradle of human existence and have begun to change the entire uh, history about how man spread across the, um, across the world. So it, it's important in many, many ways, and of course its connection to the Horn of Africa actually was by land at one point in time. So with that said, a little factoid, I love factoids, I'll remember that for the rest of my life. People say, what's it like with the UAE? And I'll end up telling that story first. Anyway, first I want to offer my congratulations to you as the new president of the Gulf States Institute in Washington, coming after a long and distinguished career with the State Department. Personally, I wanted you to know that I found the Institute research to be a great resource of information and analysis as I prepared 
to take on my role as ambassador to the United Arab Emirates. In fact, you were edgy. Uh, you approached a lot of subjects that uh, I thought were you know, quite useful in, in my introduction. Well, now into my second month in the UAE, I welcome the discussion we are about to undertake to deepen our collective understanding of the role of the Gulf countries in the Horn of Africa. I'm honored to have this position to help in the defense and the promotion of my home country, the United States of America. And during my time in the UAE, it's my intention to continue to expand the relationship between our two nations with a specific focus on commercial and defense interests. National security and prosperity depend on a strong and growing American economy. We must work to promote free trade and uh, reciprocal trade through bilateral trade and investment strategies redress unfair trade practices, and support American businesses here in the UAE. The UAE's trade relationship with the United States is a key element of this strategy. We have some $25 billion in bilateral trade each year. And the United States um, enjoys a $14.5 billion trade surplus in 2018 alone and is expected to grow this year. The UAE has been America's top trading partner in the broader Middle East region for over 10 years now, and more than 1,500 companies are present across many economic sectors in the country. We specialize, of course, in airplanes and automobiles and high-tech equipment. But we must also preserve peace through strength. America's strength, leadership, and confidence deter, deter war, promote peace, and protect our friends. Our military connections remain a cornerstone of the bilateral relationship, which is tremendously successful, cooperative, and effective. Several thousand US military personnel are stationed in the UAE at any given time, a presence that is mutually beneficial for both the United States and the UAE. Security is a top priority for the UAE government which prides itself on maintaining safety and stability for, for citizens. And as we all know, diplomacy is the best way to protect national security interest with a strong military to serve as a deterrent force against our adversaries. But we need to be prepared for anything that comes our way. And one of the key people who keeps us prepared in the Horn of Africa is U.S. Army Brigadier General Miguel Castellanos, Deputy Director for Operations, U.S. Africa Command, who assumed his duties in October of 2019, same month I did my duties here. A native of Fresno, California, he graduated from California State University, Fresno, and received a regular Army commission as an infantry officer in 1987. Most recently, he was the Deputy Commanding General Combined Joint Task Force, Horn of Africa, serving in Mogadishu, Somalia. As a senior U.S. military officer in country, he advised on all Department of Defense efforts related to defeating al-Shabaab, training the Somali National Army, and implementing security force assistance. He led international community efforts in Strand 2A, defense of the comprehensive approach to security to coordinate unity of effort and action with key leaders of the federal government of Somalia, the African Union, the United Nations, troops contributing countries, and senior political and military leaders from partner countries. Please join me in welcoming Brigadier General Castellanos for his comments on the role of the Gulf in security in the Horn of Africa. I'd like to start my discussion by reviewing some of the key issues present in the Horn of Africa that make this part of the world so critical for the next decade and quarter century. The Horn of Africa has witnessed a flurry of changes in recent years that make this region important to future stability. There are certainly shifts occurring in the crisis landscape around the Red Sea. The shores of the Red Sea are moving closer together as a result of war in Yemen, terrorist activities, the migration of people, and the trade route. 
Irregular migration continues to destabilize the region. In 2019, the estimated number of people concerned in the Horn of Africa is 14.1 million people. Of these, an estimated 4.6 million are refugees and asylum seekers. Additionally, 9.5 million are internally displaced people. To frame the discussion, I'd like to start by informing on several key countries that play a critical part in the Horn's stability. Ethiopia has formulated a robust foreign and national security policy and strategy which basically aims at deepening and widening dem democracy and bringing about economic and social changes to minimize poverty. The major objective of the policy is creating a politically, economically, and socially stable country where all citizens live equally and fairly without any discrimination. It also envisions to make the people of Ethiopia live, live harmoniously with their neighbors based on the principle of mutual coexistence. According to the latest military, I'm sorry, according to the latest International Monetary Fund Economic Outlook for Africa, Ethiopia's economy <clears throat> is forecast to grow 8.5% for the 2019 uh, Ethiopian fiscal year. The report says Ethiopia will continue to be the fastest growing economy in sub saharan Africa. The International Monetary Fund has praised Ethiopia's remarkable progress over more than a decade, which has led to significant reduction in poverty and improved living standards for many Ethiopians. The country's large infrastructure and investments are beginning to bear fruit, and the provision of public services such as education and health has increased dramatically. Prime Minister Abiy has also been an integral piece to developing security and peace in the Horn of Africa. When Prime Minister Abiy took office in April 2018, he immediately signaled his intent for a rapprochement with Eritrea. He later announced in Ethiopia would accept the 2002 boundary decision of the independent commission established by the 2000 peace settlement. Ethiopia is a landlocked country and negotiating access to Eritrea's seaports has the potential to boost economic growth and development. Addis Ababa is also juggling multiple complex negotiations with its neighbors. Further, bringing on, uh, bringing on site as Mara may help Ethiopia navigate tense discussions with Egypt on the use of the Nile waters. Both of these aspects are critical as the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, or GERD, and the hydroelectric power that it will generate is poised to come online. However, the failure to reach an agreement on the filing terms of the GERD reservoir and operation would lead to a significant decline in the annual revenue of the Nile water reaching Egypt. This will render larger areas of fertile land uncultivatable and it will threaten fisheries in the river, providing an immense catalyst for instability in the Horn of Africa. For Eritrea, the settlement opens a new path out of isolation. The Ethiopian Prime Minister has already submitted a request to the United Nations Secretary General to lift the sanctions against Eritrea. The United Nations Security Council imposed travel bans, an arms embargo, and economic restrictions against Eritrea in 2009. The measures were based on concerns that the Asmara government was funding and arming the Somali extremist group Al-Shabaab. Lifting sanctions could also help to unlock new revenues for investment and economic growth needed in the country. In all of this, Prime Minister Abiy's leadership has been pivotal. From his listening tour across the country to his initiative with Eritrea, he has chartered a new direction for Ethiopia. In order to do this, the Prime Minister has had to balance carefully the interests of the parties within the ruling coalition, the Prosperity Party. South Sudan and Sudan are currently two drivers of instability in the Horn of Africa. Sudan's reforms are gradual, and the country still faces a fractured political dynamic. However, the country's peace process, partially brokered by Qatar, is ongoing and requires a positive international influence to set the conditions for a brokered and lasting peace. South Sudan is currently at a political impasse with all parties. South Sudan faces numerous challenges, which include professionalizing the security sector, establishing ministries and parliamentary structures with the appropriate capacity for policymaking and oversight, as well as improving community safety and access to justice. All of it should fit together in a coherent whole with good governance and rule of law as a core focus of the reform efforts. 
bilateral partners as well as regional and other international organizations have supported reforms in the security sector in the South Sudan. I've finished work in the area of building and strengthening the security sector institutions together with political divisions, weakness of state institutions, and extreme poverty and underdevelopment have all been contributing factors to the recent resurgence of violence. Another important country critical to ensuring regional stability is Somalia. Somalia still faces an internal security threat against Al-Shabaab, an affiliate of Al-Qaeda that continues to fight against the federal government of Somalia from establishing itself as a legitimate government. Al-Shabaab has continued to reign its terror on the people of Somalia and are responsible for the single deadliest event on the continent that killed over 700 innocent people when a vehicle-borne incendiary device detonated in Mogadishu in October 2017. Internally, the federal government of Somalia has a long road ahead with it forming a functioning government with its five member, five member states that are all vying for their own legitimate legitimacy and a share of the money that is being distributed by the international community and from other actors that are competing for a piece of Somalia. Somalia still struggles to this day with weak institutions that are unable to deal with food insecurity and droughts that are becoming more frequent and causing more devastation to agriculture and livestock efforts. Currently, 70% of the country is displaced due to this issue. The insecurity caused by Al-Shabaab worsens and prolongs this problem. Lastly is the Red Sea. The Red Sea is a vital pathway for goods and people. European trade with Asia passes through here with oil from the Gulf to the Mediterranean, and more than 700 billion worth of marine cargo traverses the Suez Canal and the Red Sea. The unprecedented surge in political, economic, and strategic engagement across the Red Sea is challenging old assumptions and erasing old boundaries. For the fragile African states on the western shores of the Red Sea, new engagement from outside powers presents both challenges and opportunities. And now a little bit about US AFRICOM. US AFRICOM strives to further US allied and partner interests and in access to mitigating destabilizing influences on the continent. We aim to strengthen partner networks as a primary effort, to establish new partnerships with countries and organizations, strengthen existing relationships through enhanced communication and synchronization, and counter the activities of malign actors. This approach focuses on maintaining the U.S. as a preferred security partner in Africa. Our efforts focus on ensuring strategic access. Strategic access must be viewed through the lens of malign influence and coercive activities which seek to gain advantages by moving faster in economic and security markets where the U.S. is constrained by our values and law. Malign activities use economic and security outreach to foster investment incentive jobs and infrastructure growth in return for access to Africa's strategic locations, natural resources, and markets. This malign activity is an active model in Djibouti, where access through Zabab and Mountain Strait, the Red Sea, and the Suez Canal remain a strategic imperative for the preservation of international norms. Djibouti remains congested with preponderance of foreign forces with the U.S., France, Germany, Japan, and China maintaining bases and competing for access and airspace. Currently, the Djiboutians operate the Dorlea port facility, through which passes 90% of all logistics and material to East Africa. Continued access to the Dora port facility is critical. U.S. Africa Command considers access to Djibouti and to critical global shipping lanes through the Babdal Medeb Strait and imperative to ensure U.S. strategic interests are not compromised. We work closely with the U.S. Ambassador to Djibouti and his initiative to coordinate with the host nation, the Chinese, and other country bases in Djibouti to deconflict operations, ensure the safety of forces, and maintain appropriate access for our military activities. Along with U.S. Central Command, the strategic evolution of the Red Sea remains priority as we consider how Red Sea access can be maintained and expanded on the continent. It is imperative for the U.S. to maintain a viable present while diversifying strategic access to the Red Sea. Today on the Afri African side of the Red Sea and in the Babdabal Ben Strait, global and regional players cooperate and compete for real estate and port facilities. 
along Somalia's northern coast, for example, the semi-autonomous region of Somaliland is working with Dubai Ports World on developing its Gulf of Aden port city of Berbera. When development is complete, Berbera's location, close to entry and exit point of the Baldamandan Strait, will be strategically valuable for both Somalia and with whomever they choose to partner in Somaliland. At US, Afri at US AFRICOM, we see the Horn of Africa and freedom of navigation in the Gulf of Aden, Red Sea, and Suez Canal critical to maintaining stability in the region, and therefore align our efforts to achieving enduring results through the implementation of our AFRICOM campaign plan. This campaign plan is used to align AFRICOM's components, Army Africa, Navy Africa, Air Force Africa, Marine Forces Africa, Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa, and Special Operations Command Africa to synchronize and coordinate its efforts on the continent. In close coordination with the Department of State and its country teams on the continent, as well as with our development partner, the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, US AFRICOM uses a whole of government approach to develop strategies to resolve the issues we face. In Somalia, I like to say we used a whole of international community approach to work solutions to the problems we faced. More about this when I conclude towards the end. However, briefly, I'd like to inform a bit on our campaign plan as I believe it helps to understand how we plan and execute our tasks in the region. And it all starts with our mission statement, which is US AFRICOM with partners, counter transnational threats and malign actors, strengthen security forces, and respond to crisis in order to advance national interest and promote regional security, stability, and prosperity in the mission statement. And specifically, we have four lines of efforts, or we call them LOEs, to accomplish this mission. Line of effort number one focuses on strengthening mutually beneficial networks and key partner relationships. These improve and expand our relationships solidify the U.S. and our allies as a preferred regional security partner. The United Nations, the African Union, the EU, NATO, and the League of Arab States are some examples of these networks that must be utilized to advance the peace and prosperity in the Horn of Africa. Line of Effort 2 enhances the security capabilities of our partners. AFRICOM's long-term objective is for our African partners to be better able to provide effective and legitimate security to its people. Allies and institutions play a key role to advance security of the region and our Africa partners. Line of Effort 3, Develop Security in Somalia, focuses on building Somalia national security forces that are capable of providing security for its people, containing Al-Shabaab and enabling the seized governance for the federal government of Somalia and its federal member states to assume the responsibilities of providing for its people. Line of Effort 6, which is set the theater, seeks to align forces, authorities, capabilities, and footprints in agreements to facilitate U.S. AFRICOM activities, crisis response, and contingency operations. This allows the U.S. and its allies to facilitate day-to-day -day activities on the continent and respond to crisis. These beneficial relationships can provide economic opportunities to both the African people as well as their partners. So I'm going to transition to opportunities or necessities to promote uh, African peace and security. First, provide freedom of movement. The U.S. shares objectives with many actors in the Red Sea region. With 12% of the world's trade transitioning through the Red Sea, all actors are interested in freedom of movement. A framework and a multi-domain approach is required that allows interest to be met with actors that have similar or shared interests in in competition below the level of armed conflict. This approach can stimulate trade and boost trade agreements that benefit our allies, African partners, and greater international community. Second is conflict prevention. The future of the region lies in a commitment to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms, democracy, good governance, stability, and security for all people as well as inclusive and sustainable growth and economic integration at the regional level. Somalia long seen as the epicenter of instability in the Horn of Africa is moving towards meaningful change. This has been made possible thanks to the recent efforts of the federal government of Somalia and the federal member states 
including holding a National Security Council meeting in June for the first time since February 2018, as well as the role of the African Union mission to Somalia in providing security. The US, EU, and partners have made significant contributions to Somalia's emergence from prolonged conflict and are committed to continuing strong engagement. Further, Somalia ownership is essential in ensuring that these positive developments continue, both at the federal and regional levels. All partners of Somalia and Africa, in particular the troop contributing countries for, of AMISOM, the wider region of the Middle East and beyond, must support in a comprehensive, transparent, and coordinated manner in its effort to rebuild the country and strengthen its security for the benefit of all people in Somalia. The U.S. underlines the importance of finding a sustainable and inclusive peace settlement that delivers safety, security, and in the end to suffering, and in that context will continue engaging with the international institutions to promote these ideas. Third is infrastructure development. More interest in the Horn of Africa brings economic opportunities to our Africa partners. The Rural Bank provided $1.8 billion in funding between 2014 and 2016. Their initiatives support connectivity through regional transport infrastructure and increased access to broadband technologies. They foster cross-border growth and stability through support for local governance and trade facilitation. A holistic, inclusive strategy with all players can bring prospects to the Horn of Africa, decreasing the likelihood of conflict while simultaneously promoting lasting opportunities to the youth bulge in fragile states. Fourth, food security. We should be deeply concerned about the magnitude of the humanitarian crisis in the Horn of Africa. In particular, with regard to food security and access to water in regions subject to recurrent natural disasters, climate change, large-scale conflicts, and forced displacement, a multi-domain approach with all international players can provide life-saving assistance and protection, including responding to sexual and gender-based violence concerns, in particular for the 4 million refugees, 10 million internally displaced persons, their host communities, women, children, as well as persons with disabilities. Lastly, a whole of international community approach to solving the Horn of Africa's regional problems. Bottom line, the absence of an organized and inclusive forum to cooperate and collaborate can create devastating consequences for our African partners. Open and transparent dialogues amongst all actors are necessary to achieve a common understanding and developing common interests moving forward. As I mentioned previously in this brief, in Somalia, we use a comprehensive approach to security framework that enables partners from the international community, AMISOM, and others to develop a strategy that is enabling the Somali National Army to seize and hold terrain with success for the first time against al-Shabaab. The success of this effort was only achievable due to all partners having the common goal of developing a Somali national army that could provide for the safety and security of its people against al-Shabaab. In this instance, the whole of international community approach focused its resources, energy, and guidance towards this effort. In closing, rapid extensive infrastructure development is driving the need for better and more formalized security cooperation in the Red Sea. This development is funded by non-Red Sea nations, such as China, who are positioning themselves for greater influence on this vital global trade corridor. The Arabian East is vastly more stable, wealthy, and powerful than the African West Red Sea Coast nations, setting up an unequal and potentially crippling relationship among Red Sea nations. All nations of the Red Sea arena, including landlocked ones, must benefit from development without undue competition or unilateral dominance. Trusted institutions are a preferred form for trust building, policy formation, and implementation, information sharing, and arbitration. The next step is to bring all the affected countries together and continue a dialogue on the Red Sea and Horn of Africa. In particular, the United Nations, the African Union, and the League of Arab States must make every effort to reinforce the stability and prosperity of the whole region. The U.S., Europe, and the Middle East can promote themselves as a single partner in support of a regional approach, furthering economic cooperation and conflict prevention rather than fragmentation and geopolit geopolitical escalations. 
Additionally, African states on the Red Sea coast must find a way to harness this surge of new investment without surrendering their sovereignty or being drawn into political rivalries that offer little reward. Africa must develop a shared vision for deepening relationships with the U.S., Middle East, and European countries to include an articulation of a common development agenda. In the end, the interest of Middle Eastern countries in the Horn of Africa is a positive opportunity that the U.S. welcomes. However, we must continue to have an open and inclusive dialogue with our African partners and interested partners, partners to help promote African prosperity and security. Thank you very much. Now, General, I was taken by the fact that you mentioned partnership and the need for cooperation numerous times in your remarks. Um, and I wanted to start the discussion very much in your wheelhouse on security issues. Um, in the Horn of Africa, especially since you were at CJTF HOA, um, what are the issues that, where you have really needed international security cooperation to define and reach your goals? So it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and I think it's partly because of the fact that uh, uh, we've, uh, every place you go now, especially obviously in Djibouti, but anywhere else in the Horn of Africa, there's uh, um, plenty of opportunities that require uh, partnerships. Uh, and, and I can only refer back specifically to Somalia because I spent so much time there. But uh, everybody has independent interests. Each country has its own desires and end states of what they want to achieve. But I, I believe that uh, in order to make progress, uh, there's a necessity to form relationships, form partnerships, find the common understanding, uh, because there is a common understanding. In Somalia, I, I think the effort was focused on security. There needed to be a security established, and uh, through that common goal, it was very easy for me to uh, bring all our military partners together and uh, develop a single strategy that uh, was uh, beneficial to all of us. Where do you feel that you have had the most success in drawing in new partners? I mean, the ones that you mentioned in your remarks were mostly America's traditional military and security partnerships, but the Horn of Africa and the East Coast of Africa brings in a whole new set of players from uh, the Middle East and from Asia and the, the Indian Ocean Basin. So. Where has AFRICOM, where have um, American and international efforts been successful in broadening security relationships? And what, what kinds of missions, what kinds of goals have you found this the new cooperation and new partners? Hey, well, uh, specifically in, Ju in Djibouti, um, I, I think the goals come with regards to, uh, it's these uh, things that could continue to become problematic. And so, for instance, in Djibouti, I, I mentioned you have a, um, the Chinese recently have built a, a base, the Italians are there, the French are there, the Japanese. And it's uh, through coordination of, uh, you know, for instance, airspace. Uh, we have our, um, uh, our base there where we bring in helicopters and uh, airplanes and uh, the need to coordinate and uh, uh, work through the airspace uh, with the, the government of Djibouti is, uh, you know, for instance, one example where uh, deconfliction is required, and not just with airspace, but uh, the proper use of uh, the ranges uh, that we might use, and just uh, the collaboration there at the port facilities, because the preponderance of our uh, sustainment comes through the port. So it's the broader sense of being able to sustain forces out there, work together, uh, where we have seen just more coordination take place, just because we have to work together. And you also mentioned the need for expanded um, infrastructure facilities. Uh, it sounded like you were talking about port facilities uh, for economic development. Um, there are a number of countries, as you mentioned, in Djibouti with naval operations and a number of other countries developing either commercial port operations in other parts of Eastern Africa, even going down to Mombasa and, uh, and into Tanzania as well. Uh, has this been, I mean, is this the kind of development that you are looking at to promote security, or is there, 
is there coordination, coordination or competition among those players who are uh, some Arab countries, the Chinese, um, the Indians, and others who are trying to expand their reach into Eastern Africa? Yeah, this is the competition uh, that is going on. And I think uh, it's, all, uh, it's all for the right reasons, but I think it comes back to being able to uh, uh, come to a consensus, have the discussions up front that are gonna enable um, the proper use for why we want countries engaging. And again, it goes back to our African partners that are there on the country, uh, on the continent itself. Uh, they need to be involved in these discussions um, and these competitors need to understand that there's a, an appropriate way of uh, pursuing these objectives, uh, but to do it in an open and transparent form. Okay. Uh, as, as I came up, I was thinking the first question from the audience was one of the first ones that popped into my head. Uh, we saw uh, good international cooperation over the past five years in the international effort to um, counter piracy, especially from the coast of Somalia. Right. So what lessons has AFRICOM learned from that in terms of promoting uh, cooperation against this and other potential security threats in the Horn? Uh, you know, building that foundation of, uh, I think, working uh, and uh, identifying early on, uh, you know, piracy was a, is a big problem in Somalia on the coast there. I, I think in the past, uh, uh, six years, it's pretty much uh, gone down to uh, a very manageable, if not non-existent amount. Uh, Maersk was a, a company that for such a long time uh, left uh, the Somalia port of Mogadishu, and then, you know, last year they announced that they're coming back in. Uh, so I think it was, uh, you know, the UN and the AU and, and the efforts of the international community realizing that there needed to be a a Navy that was focused on uh, this particular effort, and uh, you know, it, it's paid off. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on the U.S. partnership with uh, countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, um, in the Horn of Africa, where you have been able to cooperate as uh, the GCC countries have moved more aggressively, uh, especially on the economic front, but also on the, uh, the naval front? So I think uh, a lot of this cooperation uh, has, hap has happened uh, mainly with our uh, embassies. Uh, you know, I worked very closely with Ambassador Yamamoto, who's still there in Somalia. Uh, that was more of the, uh, his line of effort that he would work with uh, his uh, international partners. Uh, but I know that, uh, you know, so I, I didn't get to work in that uh, particular realm, but I know that that's something that we always do uh, is we bring in the, in the ambassadors and the country's teams to work through those uh, relationships. Um, a little bit more specifically, the next question from the audience has to do with security in the, uh, the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mendeb specifically. Um, what have been the trends of uh, harassment of shipping by Houthi forces in Yemen? And uh, what is the trend line going? And how have you in AFRICOM and other international partners acted to reduce that threat? So uh, I think the threat uh, is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it was problematic, I think, initially. I think now we have a, a better feel for how things are uh, uh, going. And also, I, I think that uh, it, they have decreased. But usually what we end up doing is we usually uh, bring in forces to provide a, a force of presence uh, to help uh, ensure that we send the message through our uh, patrolling and through our engagement with uh, other partners to uh, uh, be, in, uh, be in routine and in constant uh, formations to show that uh, if something does happen, we're there to respond. And I think uh, that has uh, done, you know, has had positive effects so far. It's a natural seam, uh, the way we're arrayed, you know, the Department of State's curves out uh, uh, the globe into certain aspects, and we in the military do the same thing. We have that natural seam between uh, AFRICOM and CENTCOM there, so I know it's something that we have to work through. And to the north, it's another seam with uh, UCOM. So we have to make sure that we are very closely uh, across the combat commands as well to uh, synchronize our efforts. And similarly, in the, uh, in the Gulf, 
there has been some concern in this region and also in the United States about uh, whether or not the United States is going to be willing to play a leadership role in the long term, particularly on maritime security. Um, although it is not articulated as frequently, there are the same concerns about uh, the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandeb and the, the Gulf of Aden. So uh, my question is, how do you see the role of the United States as opposed to the role of China or France or the UK or other international actors who have a large enough naval presence to uh, provide leadership and security in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. How do you see this going forward? So I, I see the United States still remain uh, very focused on uh, the security there. Uh, with that said, though, I think we're going to always look to our partners to see how and where we can uh, uh, bring them and uh, use their assistance as well. Uh, the better we can communicate and coordinate with our partners is, the, I think, the best way we're always going to move forward. And if we can assist the countries there uh, on that coast, whether it's Ethiopia, Djibouti, Somalia, I think that's the future is being able to uh, provide security with them as well to enforce and enable them to be able to do it. Maybe more specifically now on the potential role of uh, GCC in providing maritime security. Uh, how would you describe the potential for cooperation between U.S. forces and um, the governments of the Gulf Arab states in helping to provide, first of all, maritime security in this, um, these important trade routes, but more broadly, uh, security in the Horn of Africa, since uh, because of the proximity of the Arabian countries to, uh, to East Africa? I think it's important, and I think it's, uh, it's something that we need to continue to do. Uh, I think there's definitely an interest on our part to uh, work with these partners to uh, develop more of a capability for them to uh, be a part of this responsibility. And in which areas do you think now they have enough capability to be um, most helpful? What areas were, are they strongest with their current capabilities? And in what areas do you think they need to begin to expand or deepen their capabilities? I'm not certain, uh, partly mainly because uh, a lot of the Gulf countries are, are uh, resident with the US CENTCOM. Uh, so if I had a expertise in that uh, area of no one, uh, then I could probably better respond to that piece. I apologize. Okay. Um, in general, how do you see the competition between outside actors, especially some of the new entrants to, the, uh, uh, to Eastern Africa, uh, countries of Asia in particular, and with uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative and significant amounts of Chinese investment, at the same time that there are significant amounts of Arab investment and other uh, origin investment, uh, how do you see the competition, either economic competition or uh, for port space, for trade routes into uh, and out of Africa, and the security competition to seek uh, the ability to project power throughout the, uh, the Indian Ocean Basin? So it's uh, definitely competitive, and it could be disruptive. Um, it, when you have these, uh, uh, again, uh, there's a lot of effort right now uh, on the Horn of Africa to develop and to uh, get your foot into the, into the mix of things. And I, I think in particular in Somalia and many other East African countries, uh, they're, they're eager to uh, have some of this money come in. Uh, it, they see it as a, a way forward for their country of uh, progressing. But uh, I think uh, I, if it's done in a manner where it's open and transparent and everybody is uh, uh, truthful to the extent possible of what they want to achieve and it's going to benefit that country as well, then I, I think it's appropriate. But it is very, uh, it could be very disruptive. I was also struck uh, by one sentence in your remarks that um, there is a imbalance or a mismatch of uh, power and prosperity on the two sides of the Red Sea, with the Arabian countries, the, the Gulf countries, having greater resources compared to the, uh, the countries of uh, the Horn of Africa. Um, how do you see this playing out? And can you paint for us a, uh, a positive scenario of how the uh, much larger resources of the GCC could be useful and productive in developing and stabilizing 
to Horn uh, in East Africa? I think it would be very positive. I think the GCC can make very good uh, uh, ways into uh, the African countries. Um, and I, I think if it's, uh, I just know that the cooperation I think would be appropriate. Uh, I think it, uh, like, I, like I mentioned, I think it'd be appropriate and we would uh, hope that there'd be more engagement with that uh, thought going in. Well, let me push you for a little more detail on that. My apologies. Um, do you think um, investment in governments, some, a lot of which is already happening, especially in Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, following the peace agreements of the past couple of years, um, private sector investment and creation of new infrastructure, such as uh, uh, DP Ports World and uh, other logistics companies who are now beginning to move from those outposts on the coast into Africa or in the security realm. I mean, where, where do you think that um, Arab countries can contribute in the short term? Um, where do you think that the, where, how would you prioritize uh, government cooperation, private sector investment, um, and security cooperation in the need to move forward productively? Yeah, I, I say government cooperation, definitely. Uh, but, you know, security is important uh, because I, I think if we can enable the African countries to establish their own security, uh, that's going to be very helpful. But I, I think it needs to start at the top. It's the government cooperation. It has to be that economic uh, stimulation that's coming in uh, to first uh, broaden the opportunities. But it's got to be a simultaneous piece. I mean, uh, El Shabaab is just uh, only in Somalia, but uh, there's plenty of other uh, uh, VEOs, violent extreme organizations out there that want to capitalize on these opportunities as well. And so it's got to be in tandem where you have this open uh, uh, cooperation as well as building that security. And maybe for a final question, let me walk back another step and again emphasize what you described as the real need for international cooperation in the Horn of Africa. Uh, you mentioned the African Union, you mentioned the United Nations, uh, European Union, the Arab League, um, and I think once the Gulf Cooperation Council. There has also been the suggestion, certainly here in the Gulf, that there needs to be a new specific organization to bring together uh, the states, at least the literal states of the Red Sea, and perhaps some inland states as well, it, to provide a new, less, um, less divided forum for cooperation. Do you see this as a potential positive development, or would this simply crowd the space within which uh, these organizations are currently operating? No, I, you know, it, right now, to me, I think it'd be appropriate. And I, I think the more uh, dialogue and the more opportunity you can uh, uh, meet, uh, the better off you're going to be. Uh, you know, there are smaller ones out there, and that's fine. But I think it's uh, if it's having an effect, uh, and this uh, other entity was to develop and, and provide a, a greater opportunity, then I think it's worthwhile. Okay. Uh, General Castellanos, thank you very much for joining us today, for coming. That's the best. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yes, sir.